Hello guys. So today I've decided to do a video about uh, the active transport, the facilitated transport, simple diffusion, and all of these things. Uh, I said last time I will do about the uh, nurse equation and actual potential, but we're not ready for that yet. We need to do this lecture and then we will move on and we will do what I said last time. So let's start out. Uh, for diffusion, diffusion, you have to understand something. What's the difference between polar and non-polar compounds? What's polarity, for example? Polar means hydrophilic. It means it likes water. Why it likes water? Let me show you what's water. It's H, H2O. Everybody knows that. But you have to know something. It's a dipole. What does it mean? It means that oxygen, it loves electrons. You know that uh, hydrogen, it's one proton and one electron. And this oxygen, it shares this electron with the hydrogen. But the problem is, it likes to take it. So this electron, it goes more like there. You know, it's more, it's more attracted. It, like this oxygen is, is hungry for electrons. So he wants to take them all. So you will have this sign. It's kind of more electronegative on this side and more electropositive on this side. Which means when you have a lot of molecules of water, what will happen? This positive charge will make bonds. We call them dipole dipole bonds. That's even hydrogen bonds, it's dipole di dipole bonds. And that's how it works. It's not really charged, but it's kind of charged, and they're attracted to each other. So that's a polar compound. That's very important. Uh, what's next? So I was talking about diffusion. The, the membrane, it's phospholipids, like this. It takes time to do it. But I have to, with some cholesterol between it, you have even spangled lipid, lipid, we don't care. You have unsaturated fats that is like this, but oh, we're not going to detail though. I can do another video about the membrane, that's not what's important. Here it's hydrophilic, uh, hydrophobic, excuse me. If it's hydrophobic, it means it's not polar, non-polar compound. It means that this tail is hydrophobic and this Head is hydrophilic. It's a phosphate head. It's charged. That's why it's hydrophilic. Because it, you remember with the, the charge, it will be positive with the hydrogen. Anyway, I think you got it. So, when you have the membrane, the phospholipid, you have the head that goes to the polar side, the hydrophilic side, and the cytoplasm is full of water. It's 80% of water. So, we have the same interaction here between the phosphate and the and the positive uh, charge. We have phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylserine, all of very different phospholipids, but that's not the point. Now I'm just getting, giving you the big picture. Uh, anyway, so why am I talking about this? It's very simple. Non-polar compound that are not charged, like I don't like lipids, because lipids, they're hydrophobic, they're not charged. Lipids, it's, it's this. It's C, with C, with C, with C, with C, with C. You have CH3 here. Palmulate is 16 carbon, for example, but it's not charged. So if it had to go through the membrane, it would easily go. It would percolate very easily through the membrane. It will go just like this. It doesn't mean in the transporter or anything. Because most of the membrane is hydrophobic. So, the non polar compound, they go. But this diffusion, it depends on the permeability of this membrane, how big the molecule is, we, we talk about the diffusion coefficient, and how thick is this membrane. If it's very thick, it will have, like it's huge like this, it will have a hard time going through all of it. So that's what happens with non-polar compound. When you say non-polar compound, it means it's not charged and it percolates very easily, really, if you prefer, through the membrane. So let's go now. Why I talked about this? Because you have electrolytes. I was talking about electrolytes, like sodium or potassium. 
when they have to percolate through the membrane, it's not the same. They're very polar. They're, char they're charged, so they can't go through the membrane like the non-polar compound. So they need some kind of proteins, even water. Water, for example, through the membrane, they have a, a, an apopore. It's like a connexin. It's made of uh, six subunits. I'm not sure, but I think it's six, but it doesn't matter. And that's how water can go. And why not other electrolytes go with the water? If there is like a pore, it's open, they can go. Why the other compound they don't go? Because there is a diameter in this pore. And it's small enough so water can go through, but potassium or sodium, they can't go through. So it allows just water to go through. That's why it's an aquapore. Just water can percolate through it. It's a very bad drawing of a connection, but anyway, it doesn't matter. <coughs> now we have other compounds. We have like sodium. We, you can have a sodium channel. Where sodium can percolate. And uh, by diffusion, it's simple diffusion, but through a channel, that's the difference with the non-polar compound. And sodium will go from the highest concentration to the lowest. And if you have potassium, it will go the opposite way. Why? Because the concentration of potassium is higher intracellularly if you compare it with the extracellular environment. I talked about this many times. Intracellularly, you have pot pot hippopotam, potassium. I told you. So that's why. Not very complicated. If you have calcium channel, same shit. We go through because it's more concentrated outside. That's very simple. There are leaky channels. We talk about leaky channels. And why just potassium can go through or sodium or calcium? It's again the dimensions. I think that uh, potassium is smaller than uh, sodium. I'm not sure, but I think it's, it's smaller. So potassium can go through, but sodium it would be too big to go through, the, uh, through there, for example. Like uh, potassium, it will be like this, it will go, but sodium will be like this, it can't go through. So that's why it's a leaky channel for potassium. And you have another detail. So that's just for people that love details. You have like carbonyl group that goes off from the subunits, and they're negatively charged, and they attract the positive charge. So you have a filtration by, by charge. Like the chloride, it can't go through. Because it's negatively charged, it will be repelled. So even if it's the same dimension, because of the charge, they can't go through. Uh, okay, let's go on. <coughs> so that was simple diffusion. You have the gradient, etc. Now, you have a difference. You have facilitated transport and active transport. They, they are not the same thing. An example of the active transport it's the sodium potassium ATPS pump. So let's get into it. So yeah, this is the membrane that I showed you earlier with the phospholipid, etc. You have the beta subunit with the carbohydrates. It doesn't have like a specific function for, for this pump. Like we will not talk about it. Certainly has, but we will not talk about it because it's not important. So initially, this pump. Where does it come from to begin our discussion? You have the DNA in the nucleus. It's transcribed to RNA, it goes out, and then the RNA is translated by the ribosome into a protein. Ribosome, protein, RNA, in ontoplasmic reticulum, it's uh, translated, it goes to the Golgi apparatus, and then it sends vesicles that are covered by some proteins that tell them where to go. I will not go into details. And from the Golgi it goes there. That's how the pump, that's where it comes from. Anyhow, in any case, now, let's talk about the membrane by itself. It has an alpha subunit that is bound to ATP. This is the first stage. We call it the E1 stage. What happens now? It has a very high affinity for sodium. It bounds three sodium, to, to be more exact. And with bounds three sodium, it hydrolyzes this ATP into ADP, the spirophosphate. And 
it becomes E1 phosphorylated. The phosphate remains here in the, replacing the ATP. So what is an ATP? It's a nucleotide. I will make a lecture about it another time. It contains a lot of uh, high energy phosphate bond, bonds. And when you hydrolyze those bonds, it contains a lot of energy. We call it delta G, it's uh, Gibbs free energy. It's just a detail. If you like thermodynamics, you can understand what I'm saying. I will explain that one day, because I'm not uh, like a uh, thermodynamic geek. <laughs> I just understand it like uh, to, to make a lecture and that's it. Anyway, so it releases this energy and uh, we use it to make this pump work. Why does it need energy? Because it goes against its concentration gradient. We said that sodium is more concentrated outside and potassium inside. So if you want to get the solutes against the concentration gradient, we say uphill and downhill it's with their concentration gradient, we need ATP, we need energy. Because uh, if you want to go to the gym and you want to push something that is very heavy, you will need maybe a friend with you to help you, and this is ATP. This is just to give you an image. An image. And if you, you bench press and you're like, you have a lot of muscles and you have a lot of strength and power, you can do it by yourself. That's it. That was the analogy, maybe it will help you somehow to remember that. Anyway, now I'm going far away from the subject. So what was I saying? Now it's in the A1P stage. In the E1P stage, there is a conformational change. What does it mean, conformational change? It means that this protein just flips. It flips to the other side, and it becomes in the A2P stage, because this is the ECF, extracellular fluids, and here it's intracellular fluid, just so you know. And here there is more potassium, and here there is more sodium. Okay, just to be clear. In the, in the A, A, E, G, E, E, two, e, P stage, the affinity for sodium is less. So the three sodium, they go away. And the affinity for potassium is more. So two potassium will bind here. And when they will bind the potassium, it will go away. It will be now the E2 stage. What happens then? In this protein, what will happen in E2 stage, the alpha subunits, you will have an ATP that will bind, we bind here. And there will be another conformational change. It will flip around, take this potassium there, those two potassium that are outside, and bring them inside. It will flip like this. And the two potassium will go to the other side. And we will come back to this stage, like I said earlier, with the ATP. And this is the E1 stage. And now it will bound. Three sodium again, and it will go out. Anyway, you got it. So we use this active transport. And what what can you notice here? When you take out three sodium and you take in two potassiums, that's why we say this is an electrogenic pump. So you lose one charge. So it will be more negative here and more positive here. To be more exact. It will be minus 5 millivolts, the difference. And the difference is just in the membrane. All around the cell and the extracellular fluid is electroneutral. But here we will have a difference of charge. That's why I wanted to talk about it now and not after, so you can understand this. I hope you did because I went to a lot of details with this pump. <coughs> oh yeah, I will talk about the last thing. So you will feel like doing medicine with me, kind of. When we go from the E2P stage to the E2 stage, you have here some drugs that can act. They are called, they are the digitalis. You know, you, you use that for the heart. I will explain to you how it works in, in, the, in the heart in the next example. You have digitalis, like glycoxin. Digitalis and uabain. 
there are some drugs that blocks this this pump, this Na plus oh, 3 sodium, 2 potassium, ATPase. ATPase, why ATPase? Because it hydrolyzes ATP. It uses energy to go against the concentration gradient. That's very important. And it's electrogenic. Because there is a more <coughs> ions that come outside that, uh, that, that the one that come inside. So that's what we use for the heart. Why we use it for the heart? You will know now. Or later, maybe we know something else before. <coughs> like I said, with aquaporin, there is a simple diffusion. It depends on osmosis. For example, I could have given an example we do it now. If you have hyponatremia, for example, or let's say hypernatremia, I'd rather give this example. Not to worry, I can do both, but this one is better for you. If you have hypernitremia, nitremia, I don't know if you write it like nitremia, maybe without the E, or it doesn't matter. And here you have this connexon I talked about. We don't care. Anyway, you have more solutes now. You have more osmoles, osmoles. I talked about it so much. You have more osmoles on the other side now. So by osmosis, because this channel is open just for water, because of the dimensions, the water will go there. And if you take too much salt in your diet when you eat, the water will go to the extracellular fluid, then it will, the three quarters will go to the interstitium and one quarter will go to, the, to your blood. And this one quarter, like if you have nitrimia that takes 4 liters, 3 liters will come here and four, 1 liter will come here. And you will add 1 liter in your circulation and you will have hypertension. If your disease or your kidney doesn't work because the kidney that works to take off the extra solutes. That's the point to have a kidney. If you don't have a kidney, you're kind of fucked. Sorry for the word. Anyway, lots of details in this uh, lecture. Now, <coughs> Uh, this is simple diffusion. I will talk about facilita facilitated diffusion. It looks so much like a French word. I have a hard time saying facilitated. Facilitated, anyway. It doesn't matter. The facilitated transport is with glucose. For example, when you take a high carb meal, uh, meal, there is an increase in insulin in the blood and in the muscle and in the adipose tissue you have an increase of GLUT4 transporters there are transport transporters that can only take glucose from the outside and take it to the inside and this is a facilitated, facilitated diffusion because you have a transporter that can be saturated like simple diffusion, if we did a graph of simple diffusion you have the concentration here and the transporter here. Simple diffusion like the connexin that I talk about, aquaporins. It will go like this, the concentration increase, the transport increase. But with this GLUT4, what's more different about it, and all the facilitated diffusion, there is not just with the glucose, there is a lot of others. The transport will go like this and like this. It means there will be a Tmax. What does it mean? It means, for example, imagine there is uh, five girls here on the membrane and there is like 50 horny men. Yes, always the men are horny, but sometimes the women are horny, believe me. <laughs> anyway. You have 50 horny men and 5 girls. So it would be like 10 men for one girl. I don't think it's Clara Morgan or something like this. They can't handle 10 men. So they will be saturated, they will be at T max, and their T max will be like 2 guys for one girl. So only 10 horny men will go with the 5 girls. And there will be 40 horny men going around and looking for other girls, and they will come back home and uh, you know what I mean. <laughs> so they reach T-max. In diabetics, 
There is too much glucose in the blood and it's filtered out, excreted, by the kidney. In the kidney, what happens? Here you have a very interesting thing. You have an SGLT transporter on the lumen side. What's the lumen? Like you have the kidney and you have this hole, that's the lumen. And this is the two proximal tubular cells, and there there is the peritubular capillaries. That's what happens in the kidney. Here it's a co-transport of sodium and glucose. It's an active transport too, but a secondary active. It means that it uses the energy from the Na plus K plus pump that brings out 3 sodium and brings in 2 potassium I chose this energy of this pump because it creates this gradient for sodium inside the cell it takes out the sodium so it creates like a gradient, a stronger gradient the sodium comes hand by hand with the glucose down its gradient the glucose is more concentrated here than in the lumen in the lumen there is more so it needs kind of energy, but it's not from ATP. It's not from ATP. ATP is used here. Here is ATPs. But this energy that is used to, use, to create this concentration gradient is used by this transporter to take glucose with it against its concentration gradient. Because the, so the sodium is going down here, like I said, in, this, in its concentration gradient, but the glucose is going uphill. But it uses the energy that is done from here, here, and when it happens, uh, it comes here, there is a GLUT2 and GLUT1 transporter, and then you have facilitated diffusion. And what happens if you have, uh, again, the 40 horny men that goes around, now there is 10, the found girls there, and they go, they go, they go, they go, they go, and here, they are grabbed by bodyguards, the SLG, they come, I have energy, I'm more strong, they take it. And then they come here and there is girls again. Let's say 10 girls. You have 10 girls here. Then what happens? We have 40 horny men. Let's say they all go through here. 40 horny men, they, they go here. And there is 10 girls. Oh, there is another problem. Just 20 men. 20 horny men. Yes, if I begin with that, I can end with it. 20 horny men with the 10 girls. There is still 20 horny men. There, what will they do? They will come back to the lumen, or they will not go in in the first place. That's what really happens. But anyway, that's just for the sake of the example. They come back to the lumen, and up, they will. You will pee them out, and this is glucosuria, and that's why you pee sugar in di diabetes. Normally, the, those transporters, they don't attain their Tmax. The Tmax is uh, at 300 mg per deciliter. I'm not sure, but I think it's something like this. So it's three times the normal value. It's good, but if you reach 500 mg per deciliter, this is a big problem. This is where this, this happens. So the horny mans, they will go, they will go out from your you know, well, if you're a girl, you have something else. So yeah. it's a good place for them if they're horny. You know, they need to evacuate. <laughs> so anyway, they go out from there, and you have glucosuria. So I talked about the secondary transport. Now I fairly talked about it. So I think you got it. I will talk about one, two other examples that are important. You have in the stomach a hydrogen potassium ATPase pump. And what does it do? It's very simple. It takes out one hydrogen and it takes in one potassium. So, what happens here? It means, if there is more hydro... If it's in ATPase, 
it means it's against its concentration gradient. It means that it will concentrate more hydrogen here than there is normally. And what is the pH? It's minus log of H plus. So, because it's a minus here, the more you increase the more you increase the hydrogen concentration, the more decreased is the pH and the more acidic it is. You get me now? So that's how the stomach is acidic and that's where you use uh, omeoprazole for example. Omeoprazole, it will block this pump and you will have less acidity in your stomach. You see how beautiful medicine is? This is real medicine. Now I'm trying to give more examples. Important, for example. Now we give you a last example and I will sum up what I said. In this last example, you will, I will give you the example of digoxin. I talked about digitalis earlier. So, in the cardiac, cardiac cell, you have the enic sodium potassium ATPS. I hope that you know it now. But, you have the secondary transport. I told you that it uses the energy from the first pump for another transport. <coughs> and here, this is a calcium sodium antiport. What does it mean? It means that the sodium it takes out of the cells Potassium is taken in, so this is like normal active transport. This is secondary active transport. It's here, it will be different. There will be three sodium that will come inside and one calcium that will go outside. Why do, you, why do I talk about it? Because when there is a depolarization of the ventricles of the, of the atria, there is, from the sarcoplastic reticulum, calcium is released. When the calcium is released, it binds to the actin side in the tro troponin, and the troponin goes out from the actin, and there is an interaction between the myosin head and the actin. We saw, we say it's a cross bridge, and there is a cross bridge cycling, that's the contraction. Anyway, I will do a lecture about that. And this extra calcium is taken out where for relaxation, you have to relax, so you have to take off this excess of calcium. So there is a cerca pump, and this cerca pump is regulated by phospholambane, that makes it work even more, when it, phospho when it phosphorylates uh, the cerca pump works even more, but this is just detail. When you go into cardiophysiology, we explain that. It doesn't matter. And this cerca pump, it's an ATPS pump, like the, uh, the NA plus K plus. It works with ATP, with, it has what E1 state and E2 state too. It's the same. And it takes calcium back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. But it's not enough. You have to take off this excess calcium. So, there is the secondary transport where this calcium is also taken out from, by this way by, while using the energy from this pump. And you can notice something, this is electrogenic for one ion and here it's electrogenic too because you have one ion that goes out and three that goes in. So it gives more of a positive charge. And in the physio books we don't talk about it so much. To be honest, they don't talk about it. But anyhow, so why did I talk about digoxin? What did I say? I said that in the <coughs> E2P stage, the digitalis blocks this, this pump. Let me do it like this. It blocks this pump. So what will happen? The secondary transport depends on the energy of this pump. So what will happen? There is no more energy to take, to take out this excess calcium. So the calcium, this will block this transporter too. And what will happen? The intracellular calcium will increase. There will be more interaction between myosin heads with actin and you will have positive inotropy. 
That's why it's a positive inotropic drug. You use it, for example, in atrial fibrillation. Why? This is more complicated. It's because the SA node and the AV node is innervated by the parasympathetic from the vagus nerve to, to calm it. Like it has a negative dromotropic action and chronotropic action. And this digitalis, it works with these pumps, but it works also on, the, on this vagus nerve and it makes it more excited. There is more, um, uh, a higher vagal influx, which decreases the SA node firing, it's good for atrial fibrillation, and the AV node firing, uh, firing, the conduction is less. So, all this arrhythmia, like, it goes all the way like this. And it wants to go to the ventricles to make it go crazy, it's blocked there. It says, bro, you're not going. So, the, you have the ventricular contraction that will be at least more normal. And this is the ventricular contraction that you depend on to have the blood in all your systemic arteries. But I will go do this in cardiophysiology, just to give you some examples. So I talked a lot today because it's a very important subject. And uh, after that, I think you will understand very well action potential and everything else. Remember when I talked about the minus 5 millivolts? Remember that. <coughs> so, last thing. Yes, there is still something. There is voltage, voltage gated channels that depend on the voltage around the moment. See, this is more negative here or positive here. Normally, the cells, they are at mi minus... 90 millivolts, and there is some sodium voltage gated channels that are closed, more like this, that are closed at minus 90 volt, and at minus 60 volt, millivolt, they will open. And what will happen when they will open? When they will open, this sodium will open like this, little by little, and sodium will go in, and we will have an action potential. This is what I will explain in the next lecture. But what I wanted to say, this is some channels, this is uh, NA plus voltage gated channel, that depends on the depolarization of this membrane. Just this membrane here, it's electro neutral, okay? Just the more is <coughs> there is a despolarization that opens it, and you have an influx of sodium, and that's how you have the action potential. So you have voltage gated channels, you have also voltage gated for potassium, but you have more leaky channels. Leaky channels, this means it is always open. That's what I told earlier, it is always open, so it always goes like this, and that's how we have minus 90 millivolt. Anyway, I will go into details after, that's why I'm going fast now. And you have the ligand gated channels. Oof, I'm getting uh, dry and thirsty as fuck. Wow. But uh, I hope that it will help you because it's a very important subject. So you have to concentrate and understand what I'm saying. I'm sorry if my English is not perfect. I'm doing my best, but it's very important, like for real. Now you have the <coughs> ligand gated. Ligand gated, it means that you have a base for the ligand, it's closed, and when it binds the ligand, it opens. Where you have this, usually, you have this in the motor end plate, in the neuromuscular junction. You have like the nerve, and it's full of uh, acetylcholine, and here you have the synaptic cleft, with the acetylcholine nicotinic receptor. They all the ligand is acetylcholine. It comes here, and here is open, and then it's leaky for potassium and sodium. Sodium comes in, potassium com comes off. You can use the Goldman equation. I will explain it with the Nernst equation, and you have the mini and plate potential that will accumulate and then will bring an action potential on the muscle, and you will have the polarization of the muscle with the T tubule. Anyway. I'm just saying in general, I'm going to do this another time. And this ligand, it's, it's here, it comes here, and then it opens the channel. That's a ligand gate, I don't know what I can say. This is, a, this is quite talkative just by itself.
Not when, not when get too old. You have also the MDA receptors that are ligand gated. Or glutamate, I think. I'm not sure. And closed by magnesium. And you have to depolarize the cell at a certain voltage. I don't know which one, I don't remember. And the ligand have to become in the in the on, in the same time. And that's how you have the the pain transmission. And anyway, that was just a deal. For the glutamate, I'm not sure, just turn in the comment is not glutamate. Um, too easy to check out now. So it's over. Let's sum it up really fast. So you have lipid channels through the membrane that go through that uh, downhill that go the electrolytes they, they go down here. So you have like apoporins, potassium leaky channels, sodium leaky channels. You have facilitated diffusion. This is the girls with the horny mat. And it will it can be saturated, there's a difference between the two, but both they don't choose ATP. So they're not active transport, they're passive. Passive transport. And you have active transport. The active transport is like the Na plus K plus ATPs that use energy. And you have the secondary active transport that uses like the Calcium, three sodium uh, channel that takes off one calcium and three sodium in. It's secondary active, it uses the energy from this term. I'll explain that. And it's an antiport. It means that one goes to one side and the other goes to the other side. You want you have the SIM port too. The SIM port it's the SGLT. Like I said, it takes glucose and sodium. And they go both in the same direction. So they are SIM port. So all this use energy it's used for polar compound because non-polar compound I can say it's here, non-polar compound they go here and they depend just on the thickness of the membrane and their molecular weight and things like that so there are non-polar compound and then you have the polar compounds that use passive transport down here and here that they use both here here it's used just uphill because sodium it goes uphill against the concentration gradient the potassium is the same it's more concentrated inside and the anti port it goes uphill just for calcium not for sodium because it uses the energy I said this again so this is the channel that you have and I missed it I try to be cool, I'm not anymore. And that's what I will use, and now I can talk about nurse equation, action potential, cardiology. You saw all the example I gave, I didn't talk about pharmacology. So I can talk about a lot of stuff now. And it will be better for you. Now I told you all the bases. You saw where I used osmosis. I said osmosis, 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 osmosis. I talked about it so much. You saw why now. In the, the example of apernatremia. It explains to you hypertension. Look, it's fucking important. It's obvious. So I hope you enjoyed this video. For, for me it took me a lot of time. Just so you know, I do this video on Sunday. Sunday is my rest day because all the other day I'm studying and I have uh, other things to do. So I take from my free time just to do this. It's not just for you to be honest. I like to teach. But it's both. I like to help too. So I really hope that you enjoy what I'm doing. And I will keep on doing it even if you don't enjoy it because I do. So I hope that it was helpful for you and see you next time. Bye bye. Goodbye.